Workistic, your work wellness resource on the go. A Thoughts to Inspire interview. At the Work Wellness Institute, the future of work starts with well being. Dive into our workplace wellness work bites for summaries of our carefully curated trending webinars, published workplace research findings, and informative interviews with key industry subject matter experts. Learn and stay informed about work wellness anywhere, anytime with Workistic, your work wellness resource on the go. Welcome to our Thoughts to Inspire series, bringing together subject matter experts from across sectors to present evidence-informed, thought-provoking ideas and approaches. These interviews invite conversation and bring attention to the most pivotal and timely workplace wellness topics. Welcome to our Thoughts to Inspire series. I'm Dr. Cameron Stockdale, the CEO and President of the Work Wellness Institute. Thoughts to Inspire uh, is an opportunity for us to bring uh, experts in their field to talk about their thought-provoking ideas. Today, we have Dr. Don Emmerich, and we're really pleased to have you here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Emmerich's credentials. Uh, it's an extensive list, so jump in if I'm uh, forgetting anything here at this point. But Dr. Emmerich is a former nonprofit CEO. Uh, she's an academic. Uh, speaker, trainer, uh, and has recently found, I'll get this right, the Institute for Trauma-Informed Leadership and Change Management. Uh, Dr. Emmerich also hosts an uncensored, uh, our Leadership Uncensored podcast, and so we're very fortunate to have her here today. Uh, did I miss anything? Is there something you want to add, you know, to that <laughs> extensive list of expertise that you have? No, it's always embarrassing to hear your bio stated, so no, you were just fine. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, you and I have got to know each other a little bit uh, recently. Uh, we've had some discussions about uh, trauma-informed uh, change management. And, and I really thought that this would be a great interview to really introduce this concept to, to our listeners. The, the term trauma-informed change management was fairly new to me recently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you and I, when we've had our discussions, it was kind of interesting, the overlap with respect to our, our research uh, yeah. and how it, it really supported what we were talking about. So maybe what, what you can do is you can talk a little bit about what is trauma-informed change management? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because it's not rocket science, right? It's, it's really sort of almost a reframing of research that already exists because of what has been happening in the world over the last 18 months, I think has caused us to really consider the process of change management and really how it has impacted people. Change is hard. Um, but I think that we have to now accept that here in the United States, especially because the last 18 months has been really brutal on many Americans. We've had bully political leadership, right? We've had the murder of George Floyd. We've had COVID, obviously. The Pacific Northwest has had to endure fires. Um, there's been a lot of trauma that has occurred in the United States. And so we can't, as organizations and as leaders, we cannot really take some of the same ways that we lead. And perhaps even when we're looking at the change management model, we have to do it a little differently because I think that the social and the emotional experiences of our workforce has changed. And so whether they've had existing personal trauma, you know, we, we know that uh, ACEs and, um, and trauma-informed um, care and um, all of those things have been in existence for a long time. What we're experiencing now in our workforce is that this overlap of the trauma that is, that is happening in our country, that people are now starting to bring that trauma into the workplace. And it's not just those people anymore. It's not just, oh, you know, she was a victim of domestic violence. Shh. You know, that's, that's why she's resistant to change because, you know, no, 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 that's not what's happening any longer. Um, trauma has now become mainstream across 
many, many people in our workplace. And I think that the way that we operate our organizations, we have to do it differently. So, so this is where the trauma-informed change management comes in. So, and I would just add, Cam, you know, we know that when we look at the change cycle, um, you know, there's all this research around resistance, resistance to change. And so the trauma-informed approach to change is to look at resistance and to say, you know, resistance is not necessarily a symptom of a person being a difficult worker. Uh, they're just the problem worker. They're just being difficult. They're hard to work for. They're insubordinate. The trauma-informed approach to change management is to see that as a symptom and to say, let's unpack that a little bit. Because if we unpack that resistance, what we know that we find mostly is, is grief, fear, and the fear of loss. But if you have somebody coming in who has been traumatized, whether it's personal trauma or some other trauma, that's a whole other level of fear and loss. And so we have to then now ask the question, you know, if you have someone that's resistant to change, it's not what's wrong with you and why are you difficult? It's what's happened to you and how can I help and support you get through this change? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, what I take away from your answer there is that sort of last bit, the important piece about asking why are you mm -hmm. acting in that manner or why are you resistant? So yeah. uh, that's, a, that's a great nugget to take away. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the Institute that you, you founded. Oh gosh, this has just been a labor of love. Um, you know, so I've been inspired by this work that I just explained and the Institute was really kind of created as a result of trying to create national standards around trauma-informed work in the workplace. The trauma-informed concept has been around in the clinical settings for a long time, a very long time. And, and, and to your listeners, they probably are familiar with the trauma-informed care approach. But the trauma-informed care approach is, you know, that clinical setting that is taking great care in delivering the services to families who are accessing Health and Human Service Services. What I'm interested in and in taking that concept and actually taking it out of the clinical space, highly effective, research to death, note that it's a very effective way of, of utilizing trauma-informed work, but I want to bring that into the workplace. That requires a set of standards to assure that people who are going to come back into the workplace to do trauma-informed change management that you are not going to create secondary harm to individuals if you don't understand the dangers of trauma-informed work go awry. <laughs> so while there is a great need for us to create more trauma-informed organizations, leaders, and change management models, we've got to assure that we've got people that are trained to do it. And the Institute is really that body, that national body that's going to create these standards and we ultimately want to run, you know, a certification process through the Institute that if you can want to become a trauma informed, a certified trauma informed leader or a change management expert, that you can go through the Institute and meet the standards for those certifications. And um, that way we know that organizations can feel good that if they're hiring a consultant or if they're hiring their next CEO, that those folks are going to meet a set of standards and criteria and, and qualifications to make sure that they're not going to do any additional harm or vicarious trauma to their staff. One of the things we talk about here in, in this organization is this idea about uh, the right people, you know, as in the leaders and the CEOs and the executives of the organization and training them to understand, you know, trauma informed uh, yeah. change or uh, from a work wellness perspective, like getting them to understand that content and that sometimes that's very difficult. From your perspective, when we talk about leaders, executives and CEOs, how do they create a culture and environment where uh, employees can support changes that are being implemented across organizations or even in small departments, for example? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I would bring 
me elevate this up to, you know, what I call the six principles of trauma-informed leadership. And I often will ask people, and this, you know, it's on my website, and I talked about it in my TED Talk, and um, this idea of if you answer yes, count the number of times. So, you know, let's do, let's do it now for your listeners. Count the number of times that you say yes to these questions, six questions that I'm going to ask. First one, is your organization emotionally safe? Is your organization transparent with major decisions? Is your organization collaborative across the entire enterprise? Is your organization cognizant of the impacts of racial trauma, discrimination, and culture and how it impacts the work experience? Does your organization acknowledge and give space to personal trauma? And does your organization, you know, ensure that staff have a voice within the organization? Those six questions. And so the number of times that you've answered yes to those really gives me a sense of how trauma-informed your organization is, or is it time for you to do a reset? It is my goal and my hope that those are questions that are incorporated into interviews. You know, what is your experience with creating emotionally safe environments? Uh, these six principles should be a part of, uh, again, your hiring practice. They should be a part of your supervision, um, incorporated into the DNA of the organization. And so I always lead with that. And I'm always very, I would be curious to know how your listeners answered those questions. I know that I'm going to go and write those down and like ask our staff <laughs> later. So, yeah. Uh, you speak about a collision course with sort of the leadership styles being practiced today. Uh, I think I read that in your website and in, in our discussions, you, you've you talked about that. Um, what does trauma-informed change management look like in the workplace when it works? Uh, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that, that collision course. And then what can I expect as a leader as the outcomes when I implement your these six questions and, and, and yeah. this, this approach? We talk about here in the United States that um, the great resignation that's occurring. And what the research is really showing is that people who are leaving organizations, they're looking for jobs with companies who are known for their compassion, for their sense of purpose, um, and their commitment to belonging and inclusion. This is what is important to the American workforce right now. And if you're not supplying that, and it goes back to my six principles, if your organization is not supplying that type of culture, people are tapping out and they're going and seeking businesses who are. Um, I would also say, you know, the, the research also shows that one out of four women are stepping back or stepping out of the workplace as well. And so we have to start asking ourselves, what's, what's happening right now? Why are we having this great resignation? And the research is clear. It is not the golden handcuffs any longer. People are usually will stay with an organization despite the toxic culture, despite the bully leaderships or the authoritative leadership, and they would stay because of the income or, you know, the, the financial perks and the benefits. They're not doing that any longer. And so I would say, you know, I would submit that if you practice those six principles and you rebuff, you know, that authoritative top-down um, conqueror styles of leadership, you're going to continue to see the fallout of resignation. You're going to see people who are tired and exhausted and they're going to leave. They'll take the pay cut in order to have a different sense of a culture that they can connect with and actually feel welcome and included. Interesting. Um, I think we've seen recently, maybe because of the pandemic or it's just accelerated this idea of creating psychologically healthy workplaces. <laughs> Right. And, yeah. I, and I think we've heard a lot about that. We read social media and it's all over the place. And, and um, 
So is trauma-informed change management, is it a, a new leadership style that we have to start uh, promoting in our workplaces? Or is this a new management approach? How would you, how would you sort of define that? I would say and. Uh, I, I think it's both. Um, you know, so I'm really, I'm really <laughs> committed to shifting or creating a new paradigm of leadership. And I, and I talk about this in my TED talk where I want to, I want to create 1 million trauma informed leaders by 2031. And I want to create a different paradigm. This, where we are and how we, you know, we've always been focused on productivity. Productivity is really important. Not saying that we shouldn't be product, you know, productive any longer. But when your organization chooses to put productivity above people, I think that's why we're having a fallout right now. People are tired. They're burned out. They cannot produce any longer. They cannot pre keep producing the widgets. And isn't it from the old days, the old days, like back in the, in the classical theory of organizational theory, where we had Taylor's best way, like I'm taking everybody back to school now. You know, we used to have that um, when, you, you know, the – when we were going through the industrial revolution where the best way to lead and to have organizations is sort of that you come into the organization and you have one specific job and you do it the best way. You keep your head down and you just process the widgets. And it didn't matter what your environment was. It didn't matter that you didn't have good lighting. It didn't matter. You, that, your job was to go in and produce. That was Taylor's best way. Some of that authoritative dictatorship type of productivity style is still around. And that shift, what I am interested in, in bringing about this trauma-informed leadership philosophy or this shift in leadership is to say, you know what, we're not going to do that any longer. That was the 1800s. It is 2021, almost 22 We've got to do it differently because our workplace is demanding it. I think you and I are both sold on on that kind of approach, right? Looking after after people themselves as a way to uh, performance and production, right? And I yes. think so. Yeah. But this is something I think new to a certain extent, or the concept is new. So anytime you introduce something new into an organization, you get pushback. I'd be mm -hmm. interested to know. Uh, where does the pushback come from? So you come in as a consultant or in your role. To, what does that what does that pushback look like when you introduce it? And who is that coming from? Is it coming from HR? Is it coming from uh, frontline managers or executives of an organization? So I think that if you had asked me that question prior to COVID, I would have had a different answer for you. But since you're asking me today, um, my answer to that question is that the resistance is actually coming from the entire enterprise. I just had a coaching session this morning with someone who we just discussed this very thing. We know that the research says in change management that your areas of your greatest resistance is usually going to come from your middle management or your frontline staff. And what we're finding is that the resistance is really coming from everywhere. And the key variable to all of that is that people are just burned out. It doesn't matter if they're a leader, manager, supervisor, frontline, everyone is burned out. And this idea of taking on one additional thing just is sending people down into a meltdown and they're going to say, stop, I can't take any additional workload and change is hard and it takes a lot of time. It's a heavy lift and I just can't do it. That's what we're finding. I'm going to go on a little tangent if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. Because it, because it just kind of yeah. came to, came to mind. So it used to be that we would do our supervisions and traditionally our supervision time with our staff, usually once a month. And um, we would use those, that time to look at performance evaluations and maybe do some coaching and talk about where are some areas to improve, blah, blah, blah. And so I've been kind of coaching and saying, you know what, we need to just turn the, the trauma-informed approach to that supervision um, in the new paradigm of leadership is that your once a month meetings with your staff 
are not times for critique. If you knew that you had to go to the dentist once a month and every time you went, you knew you were going to get a tooth pulled, you really would not be looking forward to any of those appointments once a month. You would dread going and sometimes you would actually make up excuses not to go. You'd cancel. You wouldn't be engaged. You'd go in with an agenda. That's we got to stop that. So a trauma-informed approach is that those monthly meetings that you have with your staff, those are sacred. That's sacred time. That is you don't cancel. Neither one of you cancel. It becomes a priority above everything else. And it is your time to have conversations to engage, to learn, to connect, to build trust. Um, to have that coffee, go outside, go out, get outside of the office and go to your local cafe and just learn, learn the names of their children, learn the names of their spouse, their partner. Um, that is sacred time to build a connection and trust. Then you have a separate meeting, maybe quarterly, where you look at the performance evaluations and the goals. But those monthly meetings, that is not a time for discipline. That is not a time for critique. That is a time for building professional development and building trust and relationships. And so that's the paradigm that we're trying to shift here, Cam. You've spoken a little bit about this today. Uh, you had this objective to train 1 million people in trauma-informed change management. <laughs> Pretty ambitious, huh? <laughs> it's ambitious, but um, you know, what if you reach that goal, what are the long-term impacts of that? Or what do you think the long-term impacts so of that will be? Oh, wow. Um, okay, that's a great question. I've never even thought of that. I think if we get there, and I, and I am committed to getting there in 10 years, um, I think that you're actually going to see less turnover in organizations. I think that you're going to see actually more productivity, which is in the end really what our organizations want. It doesn't matter if you're nonprofit, public sector, or the private sector. Productivity is the key to the American capitalism. It just is. And so I do think that we'll see more productivity because people are going to be committed more to the mission because they're happier, they're connected, they feel um, a sense of belonging. I also think that we're going to have an increased pool of applicants of some of our emerging leaders. And that's what I'm hoping that if we can train, this is not just about training our existing leaders. This is also about changing our curriculum in our universities. And when we're doing leadership development, you know, those kids that are actually in high school right now and getting ready to go into college, I want to start getting them into in, into these leadership groups that are in our in our you know our our high schools and and getting them to understand that this is what it's going to take to be a leader. You can't just be you know hitting people with the stick. We've got to really truly grow the carrot and use the carrot in our leadership um, in the future. And that's I think that there is going to be a huge paradigm shift. Um, and that this authoritative style of leadership is going to be shunned. It's not going to be a value add to any candidate coming into an organization. I think it's actually going to be something that will hurt a candidate. Interesting. Um, how did you how did you become an advocate for for this style of leadership? Um, and how does that impact when you're doing consultant work? How does that change the way that you? you shape corporate cultures when you walk through the door? I'm going to try to give you a simple answer to this. Um, I think that all of us, all of us, I'm not unique to this situation. I think all of us have stories of, or we remember, we remember the boss that impacted us both negatively and positively. And how did we feel, right? We have the boss that we just, will tell everyone that was the worst boss ever. Connect that to how that made you feel and to the boss that absolutely you brag about and go, that was the best boss I ever had. 
how did that boss make you feel? I've sort of I've had experiences with both of those. And that experience told me, I don't ever want to lead that way. I don't ever want to be that boss. I don't ever want to have staff that are afraid of me. I don't ever want staff that are afraid to come and talk with me, um, who are intimidated by me. That's not the kind of leader I want to be. So that's kind of the answer from a leadership perspective of that's what I, asp I aspire to be a leader where I pull people along and I inspire them to be the best people that they can be. Um, that's that. I also think that being a recipient of poor leadership and, and, um, and bad bosses, am I allowed to say shitty bosses? Yes, can I say absolutely. That? I think I just said that. Yeah. We're all out um, here. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I think, um, I've had shitty bosses and I've had bosses that have been very traumatizing and that experience of being a recipient of that, I think brings me a ton of credibility. And I think what it also has done Cam, is that when I tell my story of being a recipient to bully bosses, I can't tell you how many people say, I thought I was the only one to experience that. I thought that I was the only one that felt that way. Um, and if you experience that, and that's how I feel, I feel like there are more people now that are able to come out and tell their story and to say, this is not okay, um, and we need to change this. And so when I hear that, it inspires me to keep going. And I know that I'm touching on something. And now, now it really taps into my servant leadership, which is everything that I am. Um, and I just want to keep telling people that this is not okay. It is not okay to be treated this way. And that um, this is come with me and help me change the way that we lead in this country. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. Uh, was, I was fortunate the other night to spend some time with some former colleagues who uh, have all left the the ambulance service that I used to work for. And one of the things is we were sitting around the table and we were laughing about how one of our bosses was so bad. Yeah. Uh, and but was what was even more interesting is what we all boiled it down to. And that was that we didn't trust that that individual. Bingo. Bingo. So I guess my question then is, if trust is such a critical factor around psychological safety in a, in a workplace, um, and, and you need trust for successful implementation of change, yeah. how do we reconcile the approach that you're talking about? Um, and are there any risks associated with your approach with regard to risk or with regard to trust? Sorry. Oh, well, there's risks with everything. There just is. Um, so that's the first thing that we need to normalize is that there's not a panacea, there's not a silver bullet for any of this work. And changing a paradigm and changing the way that we lead, there's always going to be risks to that anyway. Um, so here's here's what, and gosh, we could have a whole separate podcast just on trust, right? That's the next interview. It's the next interview. So we already talked a little bit about having those sacred times with your staff. That sacred time once a month is about building trust and about the reciprocal relationship that you need to have. It is a marathon. This is not something that you do overnight. You've got ends because as a leader, you know that your staff are watching every single move that you make. They're listening to your words. And not only are they listening to the words, they're listening to the tone of your words. And they're going to follow up and they're going to make sure that you do what you say that you're going to do. Right. And so you've got to be mindful of that and make sure that you walk the walk. So whenever I go into an organization, um, if I'm the new leader coming in, um, you know, I'd, I'll do my 90 day assessment and um, to really start engaging the organization. And I have this survey that I use and the trust, the survey is a trust and morale survey. Um, I've been evolved it a little bit because of the trauma work that I'm doing. But really, in essence, it's still around trust. I'll give you a few questions that that I use. Because of what I'm doing is trying to get a benchmark of where people are in the organization in terms of, um, am I going to be set up to fail? 
right? Like, am I com- what kind of what am I coming into in terms of their perception of leadership in the organization? So, so for example, it says like, what is the perception of the current state of change? What is your perception, right? Uh, what is your biggest fear of the current state of change? And when I'm talking about the current state of change, I'm talking about new leadership. That's that's what I'm talking about. You know, what is the greatest excitement? So I'm asking, I want to know fear and I want to know what's their motivation? Like, what are they really excited about? Because it's important to know on the other end, it's not just a deficit survey. It's also an asset survey. Um, Do you trust leadership during this state of change? I want to know as a new leader, you don't know me yet, but do you trust me? What's the benchmark there? Then I have a piece in my survey that assesses um, on a scale of one to 10. um, Do you trust the current direction of the organization? And I ask them to rate it one to 10, one being hell no, and 10 being yes, I'm like bought in, I'm ready to go. And that scale is really important because what that tells me is I'm getting a snapshot in time of where that organization is at that very moment. I take that particular scale and I reassess the organization every three months. And I want to see that scale go up. If it's not going up, then I use that as a way of talking to my supervisors and my managers who are managing my team to say, what's happening here? I need you to go back into your teams and understand why we're not progressing on that particular um, uh, question on the tool. So it becomes a coaching tool for me to build trust with my team and for them to build trust with their teams so that we can keep that scale moving in the direction that it should be moving. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that you've been, uh, you've been able to link trust, the morale of an organization and link that to the production and performance in an organization. So yeah. that's that that sort of the nugget, as I keep saying, uh, for the organization and for leaders to take that away, just that without trust, you're not moving your organization forward. No question, Cam. And let me tie this back to what we said earlier. If, if I'm asking my supervisors and my managers to engage their staff to understand why that needle is not moving, you don't have those conversations in your monthly meetings. That is sacred time. That is not discipline time or performance time. So that's where we would default into using those one-on-ones to start asking about performance. And that is just a reminder to, you know, to your listeners, that's a separate conversation. Hold those monthly trust you know, trust building one-on-one sacred, really, really important. Okay. So I'm interested to know a little bit about the training for this. You're going to train, and I believe you're going to get there, uh, you know, a million people. Does it, <laughs> does it need to be, and, and maybe a little of your experience, can it be done online? Is it something that it's sort of coaching, mentoring with a one-on-one with an individual? Uh, is it a classroom setting, for example? Where have you had the most success uh, in that initial one million people that you're trying to change uh, train? Yeah, you know, so we're we're launching this almost as you speak, as we speak. Um, so we're we're sort of building that plane right now. It's going to be multi-channel, and we know that people we got to meet people where they are. Um, it's not going to just be online, um, but we are going to have an opportunity for people to take this course as an online. So we have online, in-person, in-person coaching um, as another way. And then we're also establishing um, a three-day retreat, which is going to be really exceptional. Now that's COVID. If COVID lets us have this retreat, then then I'm hoping, crossing my fingers, but it is really a multi-channel approach. Um, we want to meet people where they are. Um, In the trauma-informed piece, one of the things that's really critical is that leaders actually do need to do their own work. This isn't about changing the organization. It's also about changing you. So we know that to be an effective leader, you've got to address your own personal. I was getting ready to cuss again and I stopped. You got to, you got to, you got to address your own stuff, right? So you've got to do the work. 
the retreat that we're looking to do is really focused a lot on trauma-informed leadership, but it's about working on the leader. And so that's, I think that's the beauty of all of these options is that it's multi-channel, but it's also multi multifaceted. We're going to have a three hour um, training online. So that will, you can go, it's on demand. You can just go and, and get your three hour um, training. Then we're going to also do a four day intensive. That will be a in-person four day intensive. We may even do that online as well um, in case COVID. Um, and then we have the three day um, uh, retreat that will be focused on healing and doing the trauma informed leadership. So lots of options that we're going to be offering very, very soon. Very excited about it. Cool. Is, is this right for every workplace environment? You've talked a little bit about, you know, as a consultant, you go in and you have a survey where you link trust and, and, and motivation and performance. If I'm an executive with uh, an organization and I'm listening to this podcast, uh, can I assume that I can fit this into my workplace? Or maybe there's a, a, a workplace environment that this isn't the right approach. Um, hmm. You know, your thoughts on that, I guess? Hmm. Yeah, I'm a little biased in this answer. I think everybody needs this. And here's the reason why. I'm going to give you another, some more stats. Pre-COVID, um, a survey was done here in the United States where it showed that 70% of all Americans had experienced some form of traumatic event sometime in their lifetime. 70%. Um, given everything that I mentioned earlier, with everything that's been happening over the last 18 months, 70% is low. I believe that number is higher. And so when we think about that, if you, it, 70% is still high. If you had 100 employees, based on that stat, yeah. 70 of your employees are going through some stuff and they're probably bringing it into the office. But we know that that number is intuitively, we can project that that number is even higher. So I would submit, Cam, that yes, every organization needs to have this type of training where we are assessing the culture and going through those six principles of trauma-informed leadership. Um, yes, every organization can benefit from it. Absolutely. We made it. That was my last question. Hey, well, that was great. Thank you uh, very much uh, for your time today. I, I certainly appreciate it. I know the listeners will, will be enthralled by what you had to say. If there's a takeaway for our listeners, uh, you know, just sort of like a concise statement or conclusion, uh, if I can ask you about trauma-informed change management, what is it that you want them to take away from today? What's that piece? I can't be succinct, Cam. Um, I think well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you three statements. Okay. Leadership is not an entitlement. It's a responsibility. Okay. That's the first one. Um, leaders must do their own work to deal with their personal trauma to be an effective leader. That's the second one. And the third one is what I said earlier is that leaders need to stop asking what the hell is wrong with you and ask what happened to you and how can we help? Hard stop. Perfect. I think what I take away from our discussion today is the importance of individual intention to your staff mm. and your employees. That mm. Yes, uh, leadership is a responsibility and you are responsible for the people that, that report to you. You don't want that bad boss uh, you know, to be that bad boss. So uh, that, that's my goal. I had a different, I had a different term for you that. You had a different term and, and I will, as soon as the camera goes off, I'll use that term all day long. But uh, it, yeah, it's, a, it's an employee centric approach that leadership yeah. needs to be. And I think going back to our original sort of introduction and that is uh, 
uh, you know, the research that we do here and I've done myself personally uh, very much uh, dovetails with uh, your work. And I think it just really goes to support this idea that uh, to be a good leader in an organization, to create an organization that performs well, you need to focus on your staff and your employees and create an environment for them where they can thrive at the end of the day. So. 1000%. There we go. Thank you very much for your time today, uh, Dr. Don Emmerich. It's been a pleasure having a discussion with you again, and I hope to do this again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Bye now. Bye. Continue your learning and connect with us at www.workwellnessinstitute.org.